Hello friends, welcome to another vlog. It's Thursday, which is weird because usually I don't vlog on Thursdays, but we don't have a lot of work to do at work. So we got sent home early and I have a couple hours and I have been getting so many questions from for the q and I did not expect that. <laughs> so um, my craft room's a mess. Let me just show you what I'm dealing with here. Dun, da, da, da. So um, this is that bonnet that Lynn dropped off. Um, I thought what I would do is do a little experiment. So I got this here mic and what I thought I would do is go ahead and mic myself up and test out wearing a mic um, just to see if that improves sound from far away and then I would set you up in the corner and I would clean this and I would answer Q&A questions while I did that. I don't know if this is going to work. Let's find out. If it doesn't work. I deeply apologize and we'll go back to normal in just a minute. Okay, we're gonna see how this goes. I don't know if I'm gonna do this for very long because I tried it a couple times and I'm like, Ag, I am also gonna go off screen, but I'll just keep talking. <sighs> so the number one question I got asked was, where did this come from? <laughs> so this came from Amazon and I will uh, leave a link to it down below for you guys so that you can purchase one. I think it was like 22 or $3. It's awesome because it arranges the pins in a way you have to, you do have to arrange some of them yourself because they'll go either completely needle side out or completely head side out, but it arranges them like this and then you can just grab them super easy. And so I thought this was amazing. It's, it's heavier than it looks like it is though, but I'll leave a link down below for you. Okay. So I'm going to go put some of this stuff in my closet <laughs> while I'm doing this. So the number one question that people asked me was how did I get started? on costuming and historical costuming. So that's a very long story, but um, the somewhat short version is that my grandmother taught me to sew when I was probably like seven or eight years old. Um, but we were making actual clothes for me to wear because it was the 80s and um, my mom was a nurse and she was not married to my father anymore and so we didn't have very much money. So, um, we had to sort of do what we could. And at the time in the eighties, it was actually cheaper to sew your own clothes than it was to go out and buy them because clothes were so expensive. Now we have so much fast fashion and like forever 21 that it would have been much, it's much easier these days to be not poor, but you know, not have a lot of money and still have something to wear. Let's just be very clear. I was in no way fashionable. <laughs> I still am in no way fashionable. I'm in jeans and a t-shirt every day. I mean, I guess that's fashionable. No, not really. So um, she taught me how to sew. So I learned how to do that. Um, and then when I was in high school, we had my mom had shifted careers. And so it was easier for me to be able to afford clothes and stuff. So I just um, sort of stopped sewing. And then when I was in, not college, but right after college, my friend invited me to go to a Ren Fair, which is the gateway drug for everybody who's ever sewn anything. Um, so I made a dress to go to Ren Fair. But what I wore was actually a medieval dress <laughs> because it was like, uh, like, mm, gladrial-ish, gladrial-ish. Um, so it wasn't really the right thing to wear. And it was like super thick, fake velvet. And the Ren Faire is like 108 degrees where I live. So that wasn't genius. And, <laughs> but, um, oh, and it was kind of a mess because I had this sewing machine that just like turned everything into a ball of thread all the time. So that wasn't superb, but that was all on the inside. The outside actually looked pretty awesome. Like if I had to make like a, I guess medieval court gown, I mean, and I didn't want to go full Bernadette Banner on it and like do a lot of research, then, you know, it was a simplicity pattern or whatever, then it would have worked out. So yeah, that's how that started. Um, and then I found the GBACG, which is the Greater Bay Area Costumers Guild, GBACG, Greater Bay Area Costuming Guild. Um, I will leave a link down to that down below. And that is a bunch of people in my local area who costume together, which um, is a great group. And it's got like, I don't know, some obscene amount, like 300 members. Where is the top to this? Um, 
this is going to be part of this. I'm going to be rambly. Um, yeah, so there's like 300 members in that organization. And that is, uh, they have all kinds of events. Like some of them are sci-fi, some of them are historical, some of them are not historical, some of them are like retro, but not like the difference between what is that vintage and antique, they have vintage things and antique things. Um, and they also have classes like what I workshops, workshops is a better word. So those are definitely provided by the GBACG. So they're fun. I'm just going to check this and make sure it's still recording. Hot diggity dog. It is sweet. Learning how to use this mic. By the way, I am mic'd up. It's just underneath my shirt. So if you hear weird shirt noise, my bad. I'm going to check this out after I'm done recording and after I'm done cleaning. So, um, yeah, so I did a bunch of GBACG stuff and then I found out about costume college from my homies at GBACG and then some members of GBACG form their own little private groups as people do when they have a lot of people to deal with they find the people that they gel, gel with the most. And so there are, I wouldn't call them cliques cause like we're adults and we're also like, we like everybody else, but um, definitely you get your own like troop within that. So I have my own troop, um, which consists of a bunch of people who I have shown like um, that Regency uh, baby shower I went to was basically my troop of people. Although we were missing, I think two of them on that day, which was sad, but we can never, ever, ever seem to manage to get all together in the same room at the same time because we all live basically an hour apart from each other in every direction, which is kind of crazy. So that was having only missing one or two is like the best we've ever done. Um, anyway, so I started doing group costumes with them. And then I, I mean, I always went to Comic-Con and I have never, I mean, I went to Comic-Con for like 18 years. This was like the first year I didn't go willingly. Um, I started going to Dragon Con because my friend lived in Atlanta and then I started bringing my troop here out with, to Atlanta with me. So we started doing that. Now they go to Dragon Con and I haven't been able to go in years and I really, really want to go because I miss Dragon Con, man. That con's really fun. For any of you guys who live on the East Coast, Dragon Con is where it's at. Highly recommend. Um, what else? Yeah, so basically we got into group costuming and beautiful necklace is going away. Um, we got into group costuming and although I, I got words about group, group, group costuming too, <laughs> like it's better to do group costumes where each person's character is like something almost completely different so that you guys can all separate out and go do your own thing. We did one, the Space Girl Sailor Moon ones where we all had to be like almost identical except in different colors. Um, and that one's rougher because especially if you have a bunch of people who live really far apart, it's really hard to get organized with that. So pro tip, if you do group costumes, think about where the people in your herd live because it becomes infinitely more complicated the more um, far apart you guys are, especially if your costumes need to be identical to one another. So I don't know if I totally recommend identical to one another. Um... Yeah, so that's how I got started in costuming. I find it really fun. Uh, it's it's a, a pleasure and an honor to be able to like hang out with my friends and do this. And then I met Bernadette last year at Costume College. And at some point we decided to do Watson and Sherlock. So you just meet people and you make friends and then you start doing things. And, and the more people you know, the more people ask you to do things. Also, there's Facebook groups. I don't have Facebook. I'm like the only person on the planet that doesn't have Facebook. But there are Facebook groups for things like Costume College and or Dragon Con or whatever con you live in, Emerald City Comic Con, whatever those are. And you can join up and they will like, I think this year they had at Costume College, they had one for the historical Disney princess group. And so you can just sort of get on board and claim your character and run with it. So um, those things are possible. And that's also a way you can meet other people, too, is like you're working on your thing at home, but you guys have a group together and you're talking about it all the time. So, yeah, um, that is how that happened. Uh, where would I recommend someone start looking if they wanted to learn hand sewing? Look at your hands. 
<laughs> that's where I actually would suggest it. Um, that's my flippant answer. Uh, I would suggest that you look at on YouTube because that's a fantastic resource. People show all sorts of hand sewing techniques on YouTube. Um, also, if you have sewing books, like generic sewing books where they're teaching you fashion sewing, not historical sewing, they will teach you stitches. A lot of the historical sewing books have sections on what hand sewing stitches are. And then what I would do is just get a nice piece of cotton or muslin or whatever you can find use, I wouldn't use a knit, so like don't use your old t-shirts, um, but an old dish towel, something like that, and then just sit there and stitch. Like literally hand sewing sucks. I personally hate hand sewing, like I hate it. <laughs> but there is something about it that is amazing. I think I can hear Bernadette like right now laughing at me. Um, <laughs> Uh, there is something about it that is amazing and it, it, the authenticity of how it looks and the authenticity of how it feels when you wear it because the stitches are different. They, machine sewing is very like rigid and very, because it's so small and so exact, it like really locks that thing in there hard. But hand stitches for some reason, because, because you're working loosely and you're not using two threads that are interlocking and you're not interlocking them incredibly tightly. It, get, it has more give and flow and it like can handle like gentle curves better and stuff because it just has more space for that. So there is something about it and it is definitely worth doing. I, I'm, I'm gonna, I have the hate for hand sewing, but I also have the love for hand sewing. So um, my tips on hand sewing are like literally just do it. It's like everything in life, right? Like people ask Neil Gaiman all the time, how, do, how does one start becoming a writer? right so the thing about hand sewing is go learn your running stitch and then practice your running stitch and then go learn your uh, back stitch and go practice your back stitch and like just sit in front of the TV and do it constantly because that's kind of what it takes to get hand sewing down and it like honestly just sew every hem you can hands I that's what I'm doing right now is I'm sewing all my hand, hand, hems by hand so that um, my hand stitches get better oh I can erase this yay um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, definitely like books are, books are a thing, but YouTube's amazing. And I would definitely recommend, um, looking stuff up on YouTube and, and watching people hand stitch. Um, also embroidery obviously goes hand in hand with that. Like if you start making an embroidery piece that you don't really care about, that's a great way to start hand stitching because it will teach you all the stitches and more. It'll teach you decorative stitches and you'll just get better at eyeballing it. It takes forever to learn how to hand stitch well. So just don't judge yourself too much. That's another pro tip. Like, let it go. It's fine. It's really fine. My stitches are not 12 stitches per inch or 20 stitches per inch or whatever they say you should have. Mine are like six or eight. So, but you know what? They hold my garment together and I just do a back stitch like once an inch and it's fine. Okay. Did you have a background in sewing muggle clothes, Lolita or cosplay? Are you planning to create costumes from other eras or do, doing mashups of other eras? What are some, some notions you can't sew without? Okay, notions I can't sew without is going to be a totally separate video. I will make that at some point probably when I get back from my trip. I already have a list and I'm ready to go on that. This pin thing is going to go on that list. <laughs> do I have a background in sewing muggle clothes, Lolita, or cosplay? Um, mostly, my, like I said, my first clothes were muggle clothes. I don't make any muggle clothes for myself now, although I probably could and I probably should. I just don't. Um, I have made Lolita and she asked about mashups. So one of my one of my Lolita costumes or my only Lolita costume was actually the houses of Hogwarts. We did. I was Ravenclaw and three of my other friends did it with me. So we did each of the houses and we wore them to Dragon Con. I will place a photo here for you so you can see it. It's also on my Instagram. Those of you who don't follow me on Instagram, please feel free to come on over and follow me. Um, I I don't know how interesting it, it is, but feel free. Um, yeah, so I've done a few mashups, like Space Girl Sailor Moon is a mashup, Iron Man's a mashup, the Lolita Ravenclaw is a mashup. I have a Cheshire Cat bustle dress, which is not actually like done. I wore it to Labyrinth of Jareth. Oh yeah, people in LA, Labyrinth of Jareth is awesome. If you look up Labyrinth of Jareth, I, I don't think, I think it's lojmasquerade.com, but it just happened. It's amazing. It's a giant masquerade party that I think is two nights in LA and it's super fun. Highly recommend. What's your favorite fabric to work with or inversely, are there any that you've sworn off? 
Okay, so I have boring answers for you from that one. I mean, I love cotton. Who doesn't love cotton? It's a great fabric to sew. Like, it just cooperates. It sticks to itself. I think my cat's got a hold of this, which makes me very cranky. Because now there's snags in it. Awesome. Okay, so I love cotton. I also really like um, silk taffeta. Obviously, when I come home from the fabric district, I have a ton of silk taffeta going on. So, it's, you know, that's basically all I bring home. I love that stuff. It's crisp. It's clean. It's really good for structured outfits. It basically stands up on its own. Have I sworn off any fabrics? Um, I don't like silky fabrics. <laughs> I did a Titanic gown, which is in the trash. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I, I put that in the garbage. <laughs> um, it was awful. It was, I made, I, I was supposed to go to a Titanic dinner on the 100th anniversary of the Titanic sinking, and we were eating the exact food that they ate on the Titanic the night that it sank. Sounds amazing, right? Yeah, well, I'm dumb, <laughs> and I didn't really understand what that meant, and so I made a tea gown because that was the closest pattern I could find to what I needed. I mean, I guess I'm not dumb, I just was really inexperienced. So I made a tea gown, which was okay. And I showed up and it was a great event. Like I had a good time, it was fun. Um, this is some silk taffeta. Um, so I had a good time and it was fun, but I felt super out of place. Also, my corset, which was an Edwardian era corset, uh, just, looked horrible underneath that tea gown because like you could see it and I didn't have the right undergarments. That is a pro tip. Undergarments matter so much. So anyway, the charmeuse was a nightmare. It was not my jam. What is this? Oh, this is cotton organdy and I feel like I'm going to love this. Like it's super stiff. I, I like stiff fabrics apparently. Um, people who are not super skinny, let's just start with that look good, look better in structured things. So for example, Regency is really flowy and whatever, and you can look fabulous in there. It doesn't mean you don't look good in unstructured things. It's just structured things really give shape to your body and they can sort of accentuate your assets, if you know what I mean. So, and I don't mean your butt, I actually mean your assets. <laughs> so they make people who are um, not super skinny, look awesome. So I like structured fabrics because they help make the outfits that I want to wear super awesome. Also, bustle dresses look really great in both cotton and um, silk taffeta, and that's what I am drawn to, as does 18th century. So I feel like I found my, my hole here in the, the cotton and silk taffeta. I do not like slippery fabrics. I do not like charmers. It was all over the place. It was hard to stitch. It snagged. It stained. Ugh. I don't think I would ever consider organza. I'm going to have to at some point, but I don't like it. <laughs> so yeah, slippery, slidey fabrics, like silky, smooth silks. I'm just like, nope, not my jam. So yeah, I've sworn that off. Um, linen is not what I thought it would be. I thought it would be more like cotton. And you can't, some linens are, but m the linens that I've worked with so far have been really like, sorry, I'm unwrapping this cards or what are these? They're the little prints from Bernadette. I got two of them to support her. Um, and I'm gonna put them up on my board. Um, yeah, they, linen, linen slides all over the place too. And I'm like, what? Um, so someone told me that you can gelatin it, which means basically use gelatin to stiffen your fabric and then you can just sort of wash it out afterwards. Um, I don't, t I tend to wash my fabric the once and then like very rarely as very needed. So I guess I would do that for linen because that seems like the thing to do, but it, it makes me kind of nervous. Anyway, um, oh no. And that fell. Cool. Anyway, uh, those are the fabrics that I love and the ones that I try to stay away from. But I mean, I guess I would try anything. 
and I would I, I want to learn to, to use them let's put it that way oh I don't deal with knits also I, I have so far managed to avoid my entire life sewing any knit whatsoever I'm frankly terrified of my serger and don't really know what to do with it so I purchased it and now it's sitting in a box in my garage right where it's the most useful I, lots of people are asking about my dress form too um, my dress form is a uniquely you and people are asking how I adapted it to my own personal figure. Okay, so one, it is not fully adapted. There are parts of this that are bigger than I am. And I would have to use a, um, like one of those things you carve turkeys with, That's but it's electric. An electric turkey carver would be the words I'm using for. So like her shoulders are too long from here to here. So I would have to shut that off. Um, her boobs are also like really low. So I'd have to essentially cut her boobs off and then put new ones in. But this is called a Uniquely You. You can get it at uniquelyyou.com. And it has this cover, but there's another cover underneath this. And it comes with a system of pads to help you pad it out to your own measurements. So like I put a belly on it. I put the, the bus up higher. Like I stacked cups on top of the bus. You can add to the hips. Oh, her butt is way bigger than my butt. So I would like to shave her butt down because I'm completely flat. So uh, Uniquely You is the way to go for, let's just say a mid-range mannequin slash dress form that is adjustable to you. It's made out of foam. The reason I haven't adjusted it more and cut those things off, which I don't have any justification for is because I am scared that I'll cut off too much, but that's actually better because then you could just pad it out to whatever you wanted it to be. So at some point there will be a project and that will also be a video of me fixing my uniquely <laughs> to actually be more like me. Like I don't have her, the hips and butt she has and my stomach is a completely different shape than this. Like my stomach starts like way up here. So I should bring it out like this. But the thing is the measurements are actually correct right now. So like I can close this over her. If I added stuff to the front, it would actually make the measurement too big around. So I have to be able to take some out of the back. So until I have like the gumption to do that, it's probably going to be a little bit before I make my uniquely you exactly me. But I did pat it out in, in ways that help it become more like me. It's uniquely vaguely like me. <laughs> so that's where we're at with that. I thought I would do a couple more while I'm just sitting here. What type of corset is a good one to start for someone who has never made a corset? I'm working on a skirt that is loosely based on a Victorian walking skirt while listening to Jane Eyre. <laughs> Those are totally different periods. Uh, that's really hard to say. So my first corset was a Victorian corset. I used Laughing Moon 100 pattern and I really enjoyed that. Like I felt like that was a great pattern to start with. It wasn't very complicated. I learned how to put in a busk. I learned how to put in... Um, grommets I did all that kind of stuff and it does use boning so you can choose how you want to do that that was the easiest way for me my Regency corded corset was actually super easy to make um, it's a lot of straight line stitching as are all corsets so that one might be a great one for you to use I don't know um, that's a really hard thing I w you, sh you should make whatever corset you need for whatever outfit you want to make at the time so like if you're working on a Victorian skirt let me just move you guys over if you're working on a Victorian skirt maybe you should make a Victorian corset I, I recommend that laughing moon pattern it's um it's kind of poo-pooed by the corset people um probably because it has less like it doesn't have hip gores and it doesn't really have well one version of it has bust gores but the one I made didn't really have bust gores so the pattern pieces were just cut like that. It's sort of poo-pooed as like a very simple corset and it doesn't take a lot of talent or skill to make, but I don't, I, I, it is historically accurate, so there's nothing really wrong with it. Um, by far, it is the corset that I wear the most because it is by far the most comfortable corset that I have. I would say basically any corset you wanna make is an easy one to make. The thing that people forget about corsets is they're not hard. They're just tedious. Like, it's just a bunch of straight lines, guys. It's really not as complicated as everyone make it sound. The hard part about corsetry is the fitting. And for the fitting, the best thing you could possibly do is have another person there and talk them through how you want to fit your corset. And really what I do when I 
or what I did when I learned how to do this was I had a you know Carol Wood um, who's super awesome like if you guys ever meet Carol she's she's so awesome uh, she had a class and there was like probably 20 of us making corsets and she would have us make our mock-up and we made it out of like duck or whatever so some very stiff fabric we didn't I don't even think we boned it but we did put in lacing strips and lacing strips are the grommets but they're already made into strips and then you just sew them onto your sample corset so you don't have to keep grommeting your corset so I have lacing strips like all over my house <laughs> um so yeah uh we had her fit us so you put your corset on and, and it's sort of easier to put it on inside out in some ways and you just pin it in the front where the busk would be and uh, or a lot of people put the busk in like it's good practice to put the busk in so maybe you want to do that uh, it helps with the tension because then you can tighten it down a lot more if you want to put the if you put the busk in I mean it's definitely better to do that um, you can also put some temporary boning in you just tape it down honestly with masking tape um, and that'll serve well enough like it's that's fine to do so we do that and then if you put it on inside out it's a little bit easier but um, then you could just take the seams and pinch out all of the parts that you don't want and you can slash the parts that you need to add to and add fabric behind them and then just recut um, your corset. It's a lot easier also to grade a corset if you have a pattern. So <sighs> some people start with foundations revealed. I think like Bernadette's first corset was like one that she had to like essentially pattern out herself. You can go that route if you feel comfortable with it. I am not. <laughs> Bernadette by any standard so of course I learned on a pattern and then all I did was look at the measurements and I went oh I'm slightly smaller like my bust measurement is smaller than my waist measurement and my hips are really smaller because I I'm exactly an apple um, so um, I used the biggest measurement which was I think the waist measurement and then I just I knew I was like a size whatever like just say I'm a size 18 here but I'm a 16 here and a six and a 14 down here I just took the pattern piece and then like drew a line that gradually went from the 18 to the 16 at the top essentially cut that out and you know what it almost fit perfectly so I would say any corset you want to make is the easiest corset to start with it's not really hard it just takes a long time like it takes me like 40 hours to make a corset or more um, and that's like once I have a pattern that's settled on <laughs> so it's just a bunch of straight lines though it's really not that complicated and you honestly could just draw those lines on and sew right over your your lines and then use disappearing ink or um, chalk or whatever you need that'll go away and make sure those lines are on the inside no problem um, it's just tedious it's not actually difficult uh, fitting is difficult and the best thing to do is have another person around that'll help you because you can't really fit the back. Like, I don't, there are people who do it. Those are ballsy people. Like, I don't. I always get someone over to, to come over and, and help me fit my corset. Most of the time though, I use the pattern and I do that grading thing and it turns out just fine. I only have to take a little bit out here and a little bit out there. Um, knowing where to remove from is very important. Um, you don't want to like take it all out of one seam unless that is exactly where all the extra fabric is. So you do want to definitely read up on how to fit your corset, but I think all corsets are essentially the same. I made my quarter corset and it fit me out the gate. Like I didn't really have to do any adjustments. I think I took out a hip core because I don't have the hips to fill it out. So I just removed it and it was actually totally fine. <laughs> like I think I took a quarter inch out of like right here. So it doesn't have to be as complicated as everyone makes it to be, especially the first time. You can make corsetry very, very complicated for yourself if you would like to. And it's largely in your head and what you choose to make. If you start small and then just start adding techniques as you start making corsets, like maybe next time, maybe you make that first one. And then the next time you make one with gores in it that help uh, bring in your piece right here, but then flare out to cup your bust. Or the same thing with your hips, gives you more hip spring. Gores help with that sort of thing. So maybe the second corset you make, like my, like I said, my Regency Corded Corset um, has gores, and so does my Edwardian Corset. So yeah, corsetry is like all what you make of it and how hard you mentally think it's gonna be. If you just go into it and be like, I got this, it can't be that hard, lots of other people do it. It won't be that hard for you. <laughs> like honestly, I truly believe that. A lot of people have been putting things in the comments like, oh, I wish I had your talent. 
um, I wish I could learn this stuff, stuff like that. And I did kind of want to address that. It's not a talent. I do not naturally do this well. Like, that's not a thing for me. That's why I have like little misorganization on the whiteboard and stuff. It's not a talent, honestly. It's what everybody keeps saying. It's a skill and you can learn a skill. Like anyone can learn this skill. It's sewing is as hard. It's like, it's like corsetry. It's as hard as you want to mentally make it. Um, skills are difficult to learn you know when you learn to cook or when you learn to drive or when you learn to do anything that's all a skill it doesn't mean that like some people just aren't good at driving it means they haven't practiced their skill and they're not very good at it because they haven't put the time in the same thing is true with sewing like if you want to make costuming if you want to make costuming if you want to make costumes just do it and like you will get better as you go it's not a natural born talent. I didn't come out of the womb knowing how to sew. It's a hundred percent something that anyone can learn and it's really not difficult at all. There are parts of it that suck and, and there's things that you do that are difficult but the, the general concept of making historical garments and sewing is super easy. One of the reasons that I make like I like bustle dresses because they enhance my shape like I was saying and they're very good for people who are not microscopically thin although microscopically thin people look great in bustle dresses too um, is because I find the techniques that you use to make bustle dresses superbly easy like there are skills that I have mastered and and you know like I'm really good at darts and I'm really good at you know doing swallowtail things or whatever like whatever the things are that are or putting 100,000 buttons on your <laughs> your outfit I'm good at that at this point even though I'm kind of I'm always scared when I get to the button section no matter what I have to do um yeah I just got good at those and so it's much easier for me to make that kind of dress and like I was very nervous about making an 18th century gown and then I made one and now I'm like oh I could do that I could do that all day easy peasy no problem so I think the fear of not knowing what you're doing holds a lot of people back and I'm like trying to figure out how to say like just do it <laughs> without like insulting people because I don't want to make light of the fact that you're worried about it or that you feel like you don't have the skills or that you know you're scared and intimidated by all the people who are super good at it. So the, all of those people started at the same place. Nobody knows how to sew from the get-go and a lot of people that you think are amazing just started sewing a few years ago like trust me there are big names out there that haven't been sewing for very long and everybody thinks that they're amazing you can be amazing too and they are amazing they learned their craft very quickly and they're very very skilled at it and it's because they dedicated the time to it and you can be there too all you have to do is just start it's like anything in life just start and you will just get better it's a little bit easier if you have people around you that sew, but you know what? There's people everywhere that sew, and you don't know it until you start talking about it. I started saying something about making costumes at my work. There were like five people at my work that also like making costumes. They didn't know anything about the GBACG. I got them into the guild. Like, I'm, I've started selling them on going to events and sewing and having sewing days with them and stuff. It's, it's like way more common than you think. There are also people who don't sew that want to learn with me. And so they are going to come over and learn to sew stuff with me. So, you know, it's sort of better with other people. It's hard to sew with other people because there's one machine and probably one, like, most people don't start out with a cutting table. You start out with the dining room table or your carpet, <laughs> which like every time Bernadette's cutting on the floor, I'm just like, oh my God, my knees. Um, <laughs> so um, I think she's setting up a space that's going to make that a little bit better for her. But um yeah, just start. Just do it. Like, it is it is hard if you make it hard, and it's complicated and intimidating if you make it complicated and intimidating, but my mentality about most things is if, like, if that chick or that dude can do it, oh, also boys do it, and I'm like, if a boy can do it, I can do it. No problem. So, <laughs> I just go through life thinking that about everything. Like, if that person can do it, I can do it. Can't be that hard. And then I just do it. And sometimes, like, I screw up. Like, you guys watch me screw up all the time in these videos. So I just back it out and do it again, or I cut another piece and do it again, and then I know how to do it, and from then on it's fine. So that's how you learn stuff. So don't think that you have to have you have to have talent for this. You don't. You just have to practice your craft and practice your skills, and that just takes time out of your day to do it, and that's all it takes. So 
I encourage everyone to practice their skill. Like, you can do it. It's really, really not that hard. You can start out with super, super simple things. Like I definitely recommend starting out with undergarments like shifts and bloomers and also things like skirts are super easy and they teach you the stitching and the skills and you know they're forgiving if you cut a little bit weird and stuff like that so I would start with those and then as your skills improve like get moving towards bodices and corsetry and stuff like that definitely um, but start with the pieces that are easier to sew and practice on that and then you'll have a skirt and you'll be like oh my god that was not that bad this is super easy and then you're like this skirt could be fuller I'm gonna make a petticoat and then you make a petticoat and then you're like wow that looks really good hmm I wonder what it'd be like if I had a corset under this and then a bodice that went with it and you start sewing that stuff trust me instructions are mostly really great and if you don't understand the instructions it's on YouTube <laughs> like you can find almost any instruction on YouTube um, or if you don't understand a word, Google it. Like, it's really, it's really, really not that hard. We had one question is, how do I choose my fabric for my outfits? Okay, so most of the time I don't. I have my fabric and I choose my outfit based on the fabric because I fall in love with the fabrics and I say, oh, that would make a great Regency or that would make a great bustle dress or that would make a great 18th century or whatever it is I'm going to make. So 99% of the time, I do it that way. I have my fabric first and I always buy 10 yards because 10 yards will cover almost everything. And sometimes I have to buy like an accompanying fabric, like if a skirt needs to be an off color or a complementary color or something like that. But then it's obvious how you choose that. You just choose the same fabric but in a different color. Um, I usually try to buy complementary colors and I buy 10 yards of each or 15 yards of each because I don't know how much I'll need. So. That's how I have so much leftover fabric all the time. So most of the time I don't do that. I choose my fabric first is what I'm saying. There are times when I need to choose fabric based on the outfit, like for Space Girl Sailor Moon. That one was actually pretty easy because we all decided as a group which kind of fabric we would need and then we all brought the different colors of that fabric. It's like a little bit sparkly um, and it's synthetic craziness. So. <laughs> I have never, oh, okay. so Watson, for example, I knew that I would need brown and cream fabric because that's, those are Watson's colors. So I found my favorite fabric, which is some top it. <laughs> I, I bought it in brown and cream and then I was ready to go. Um, Iron Man, I needed a certain color red and a certain color gold. Um, I sourced those largely from India. Um, I can't recommend that process, by the way. Uh, the guy sent me, I, I ordered a very specific red in a very specific width and the guy sent me a smaller width and a totally different red and I sent him an email back saying this is completely wrong and he's like cool send me that fabric back and I'll send you new fabric and I was like no I need to get started. You send me the fabric that I ordered to begin with and then I will consider sending you this fabric back but I don't trust you because at that point he had like you know billed my credit card and stuff. So. He went ahead and sent me my fabric <laughs> and then he sent me another email saying don't worry about the first fabric. Uh, so I gave that to my friend so that she could make a different bustle dress with it. So um, it did end up coming right but it was definitely a nightmare and if you were crunched on time, ugh. One thing about sourcing fabric I would say is like don't do that at the last minute <laughs> and buy way way more fabric than you need. Like for a bustle dress I, I actually need maybe seven yards like I can make one in seven yards but that doesn't include all the trim and then you have you know and you and it doesn't include if your fabric has a pattern or a nap or if the if your fabric is like shot or duotone like I have that this or this one shot actually it looks different colors depending on which way it is it's what a shot fabric looks like and this one's just very gently shot but um it's because the warp threads and the weft threads are actually different colors so if you have one of those you have to cut your pattern pieces in a certain way or else the like your arms will be a totally different color because the light is hitting them because you cut them not in the same way as the rest of the body. I don't know how to explain this. <laughs> I hope you understand. It effectively is the same thing as having an app or a pattern. You have to cut them all the same way and so if your um, diagram, I don't know if you guys all follow the diagram that you're given on your patterns about how to lay out your fabric to the best possible ability. You can't do that when you have shot fabric or it just won't look right. So 
um, I just buy extra fabric. So I would always recommend that if you are gonna go out and purchase fabric uh, first, just to get a lot. <laughs> Um, if you have to choose fabric, then I would never buy exactly what they tell you. Like if it says three yards, I buy like five or six because my I may also mess up. I may want to make trim out of the same fabric. Like there are a million reasons you will need more fabric. I may want a matching bag. I may want to trim my skirt with the same fabric. Like I may want to make a hat. So I just always have extra fabric and that is cost prohibitive for some people. Sewing is not a cheap hobby, guys. Like, it's just not. Everybody thinks, like, oh, it's cheaper than making your own clothes. No, 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 it's not. <laughs> so, it's one of those things where if you can possibly afford to buy more fabric or... I would never say go buy a cheaper fabric and get more of it, unless it's, like, I guess cotton, because most cotton... I don't know, even, not even then. Like, there's some cotton that's way better than other cotton, so... I, yeah, it's a hard one. Buy as much as you can afford. Let's put it that way. That's what I do and always overestimate, just always. I have a hard time talking about stuff like this on my channel because I also don't wanna like ostracize or make people who don't have the money to afford it think that they can't do this hobby because you absolutely can. Like you can, if it says three yards and you only have money for three yards, get the three yards because it's better to do the thing and, and get it done and practice with it and stuff. It's just that, if you wanted to make a matching this or you wanted to use trim and stuff you won't have that capacity and you may not be able to find that fabric again depending on where you get it because like i get it in the la fabric district and ugh. unless you're shopping at home fabrics it's like really hard to find the same fabric again later so if you can afford it buy more i sound like super bougie and i spend way too much money on fabric guys just like it's it's dumb like it's super it's stupid i'm gonna spend the next year sewing for my stash basically i will have to buy like complimentary complimentary fabrics here and there but i am making an effort to actually use up all the fabric that i have not all of it but you know use up fabric that i have so i a get more space and also i get to use all the stuff that i love and i bought because i thought it was gonna be awesome <sighs> anyway i hope none of you take this as me being elitist I guess I don't I don't in any way want to be that way I just want to I, I want you to be careful and have enough of what you need to, to, to get the job done if you have striped fabric you really need to buy extra because sometimes that stripe like and especially if you're gonna try to pattern match your stripes oi you need to buy extra because you have to slide those pieces farther away than you want to by it by a long shot so that is my diatribe on fabric <laughs> Okay, how many costumes and historical dresses do you make a year? Does it depend on the amount of events you, you plan to attend? Okay, so, ooh, that, that's a wide range question there. <laughs> um, I actually have more, like, eh, it's about even. I have about even on costumes versus historical. Uh, and then I have, like, like, Iron Man is historical. I can take out the centerpiece that has the the arc reactor in it and I replace it with another one and then it's a historically accurate dress and the hat has a thing that just clips off the mask and clips on another thing and then we're all good to go. So it's about 50-50. I have made up to five a year and then I took five years where I didn't sew anything so it's all over the place. It does depend on how many events I have to go to but it also really depends on if I have to make the undergarments for it. If I have to make the undergarments and I have to make all of them like I only made two dresses for this trip like that's it because I had to make um, chemises and underdresses and petticoats and Spencer jackets and corsets and all sorts of other things and then also I had to make the dresses. So I've only made two dresses this entire year. You guys have been watching me for seven months now? Seven, I think seven is right. Seven months of making these, these gowns and I, I've only made two. <laughs> I have made a lot of articles of clothing. I think I made like almost I think like 15 articles of clothing, but there's only two outfits there. So I guess it depends on that. If I have the stuff already, then I could make way more dresses every year. And that's sort of what I'm trying to do is build the undergarment wardrobe up so that I have the opportunity to make more outerwear clothing, not outerwear. I guess those are jackets, huh? You know what I mean? Stuff you can see. <laughs> uh, because the foundation is the most important. So you have to make those first and you have to make sure that they're right 
and that you have the stuff you need. I may make it, make an occasional bum, bum roll or another petticoat or something like that, but I mean, I can make 18th century now, I can make Regency stuff, and I can make Victorian, well, let's just say bustle dress, some, some areas of bustle dress. I have early and I have late bustle dress under garments, although I just wear the same corset for both, so whatever. But um, I don't have that middle section anything because that natural form is a completely different silhouette. I'm not sure I'm built for natural form. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if that's going to look that's going to be good on me, but I do love some natural form dresses, so there's some chance I'll give that a go at some point. Um, and then there's all kinds of 18th century dresses that I could make, so it's just like different size panier, different bum rolls, stuff like that, that you need to put in there. Um, but other than that, I just need to wear the outerwear, so that's what I've been working on all this year. So... I can make a lot of garments in a year, but how many dresses do I make? Probably like two or three. It does depend on if I'm going to go to like Dragon Con and if my friends are like, we're going to do four group costumes together and I'm like, uh, okay. They are constantly trying to talk me into making armor. Ooh, they want to go as like Amazons from Wonder Woman and I'm just like, no, a bunch of apples are not going to look good. <laughs> that? Uh, they really want to do it though, so I don't know. Maybe someday I'll do it with them. I, I, I don't know. I was the one that was like, Warbla is the best. I want to do Warbla everything. And then I thought about armor and I was like, uh. I also don't really want to wear Warbla in Atlanta, which is where they would want to do it at Dragon Con. I just think it would be so hot and the Warbla would start warping. We will see if they talk me into it or not. I kind of owe them. They did Houses of Hogwarts and they did Space Girl Sailor Moon like at my request so I owe them I don't know when that armor thing's gonna be because we I have to learn that skill of Warbla to like make it good like dremeling and stuff and I don't I don't currently have that skill so guys this video is gonna be crazy long <laughs> you may actually get more video than you wanted this week we'll see oh I do have really good news I got pinged by Desiree today of designed by Desiree link down below for you and she is gonna meet up with me and Nikki in Amsterdam and I am super excited about that um, I would love to go hang out with her so that will be in the vlogs when I'm on my trip we should talk about trip vlogs so I'm gonna film I don't know how much I'm gonna upload I may upload all the time like if I have enough footage I'll just bust together a, a vlog for you and just pop them up a couple times a week there and if I don't have time or energy to do that, then I will do it all when I get back. So I'm not making any commitment as to what's going to happen while I'm on my trip, but there will be a lot of footage. I will definitely film as much as possible for you guys so that you can see what happened on this trip. You guys have been on this adventure with me for so long making all these clothes. So I want to share the trip that they were made on. Made for, made for, with it. For the third time. <laughs> You guys have been on this adventure with me this whole time making all these clothes for this trip So I figured it would be awesome to share the trip with you guys and show you everything that happens that I can some of it I probably can't but some of it I can so it should be a good time And I hope you guys enjoy like travel vlogs because that's the thing um, I'm looking forward to it. There might be some kvetching in that <laughs> so I'm like, oh my god, it's early <laughs> She wants to get up early every day, and I'm just like Okay, cool I'm not a morning person, guys. I am a up late person. So hopefully being in Europe and having that weird jet lag that makes me wake up super early will be to my advantage there. Anyway, I have a social date with a friend tonight, so I'm going to go do that. I will meet up with you guys again tomorrow. Lynn sent me a very long email. Before I sign off, I should tell you what she said. She said that I don't maybe need to do the steaming and freezing of the hair. I told her I'm going to do it anyway because I want to see it. She said, I noticed that some people have never heard of styling synthetic hair with cold. Maybe they could read my article where I make curls. Um, and then she leaves a link and I will leave that link down below for you. lynnmcmasters.com slash articles.html in case you just want to type it in. Um, and the link to it is on the right, she says. I noticed someone ask you if you were going to style your own hair into Regency and you might want to let them know that Regency, in the Regency period, many people used hair pieces also. I'm not going to use a hair piece, I'm just going to braid my hair up and basically I'm wearing a hat and in the evening I'm wearing a turban so that I can hide it. 
because that's my jam. <laughs> I don't want to do my hair as much as possible, especially on this trip. The thing about it is like I would feel like I need to bring curlers and stuff like that and that just takes up room in my my uh, suitcase. I cannot, I have, an, I have a curling iron, I understand how to use it. Those curls don't last. I need to use curlers and I need to use a lot of product that I just really don't want to bring with me. So this is what's happening. Okay, now you have heard from Lynn. She is also sending me a pashmina to wear uh, as a shawl in the evening to decorate my outfit a little bit more since I'm not making the external uh, overdress or little in, in uh, sleeveless Spencer, I guess that would other thing. Was gonna, I'm going to make those later though. I'm actually excited about making some of those. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now. I was like a 45 minute video already. Hello from Friday. So I was gonna make this one big long vlog with lots of questions and answers and wig styling and all of that, but I edited this vlog last night and it was already 50 minutes long with Q&A. So I think I'm just gonna put a part one and part two up, which means you guys are, <laughs> like I thought I was gonna have enough content and now I have twice as much content. So I'm just gonna give you guys an extra video this week, which is great. Um, I guess I just ramble on and on too much. Also, please remember, all these opinions are just my own opinion. They're not like facts or anything. They're just how I do things. So yeah, um, I am gonna go ahead and post this. And if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. Uh, leave comments down below. Let me know what you guys are working on, your thoughts on things, stuff like that. Um, I would love to talk to you guys down in the comments below. And I will see you guys later this week with the rest of a Q&A. And hopefully I will have that wig styled soon because otherwise, I'm not going to have a wig, so yeah. <laughs> okay, see you guys later. Bye.